And look at that right there. Parts are starting to pile up. Hello, everybody. Good day to you. Welcome back to the channel. I'm glad you guys are here. I know. I am super glad to be here. We are venturing out to the back of the parking lot to go fetch that red in color. I think it's an 06 Ford Mustang GT. I believe it has the 4.6 in it. Uh, we've done some work on that before. It used to have this, uh, this nasty O2 sensor problem. Uh, turned out we had a, uh, a rub through wire on top of the transmission. Uh, this one is not here for such things this time. Uh, we are here because customer states uh, loud screeching grinding noise uh, while driving and uh, it changes tone while braking. So I am uh, of the opinion that I brought the wrong key with me, but I do believe that we have a brake system issue on this uh, particular Stang. So let me go ahead and fetch the keys. We're gonna hop in, go for a test drive, and then uh, we're gonna see what's ailing uh, this particular uh, little hot rod right here, and then we'll go from there. So stay tuned because this is gonna be a very good Mustang video. Ah, there we go. Now that I got the keys, we can get the show back on the road. So. You guys may be wondering, whoa, I'm going to die. It's hot in here. It's 140 degrees guaranteed. You may be wondering why I have a pile of parts. Oh, come on. Wow, that just got weird. Okay, so back to my pile of parts outside. Why do I have parts here when I have not uh, done any work to uh, the vehicle? And uh, the answer is quite simple. Uh, I have uh, worked on this vehicle before and I've previously inspected said vehicle and we were aware that the brakes were uh, in need of some TLC at some point and uh, they had a little bit of time so we didn't really press the issue uh, back in the day but uh, now that we're making some grindy squealy awful noises and vibrating uh, I figured it was time to go ahead and move on that brake job so in order to save some time I went ahead and ordered them and now they are here but the car is broken again. So let me go fetch a jump box and uh, we'll, we'll try to get this thing back to life. This is not working out, not my day today. Actually, let me rephrase. I need to fetch the jumper cables, the good ones, the zero gauge 25 foot cables. The reason I prefer the cables as to the actual jump boxes is I have found the jump boxes just do not hold up over time. You know, I can buy one and it lasts about a year before I need a a new battery sometimes not even that long and yeah they come with warranties and yeah they're a little bit more convenient but those uh cables over there have never failed me so i just continue to rely on uh on jumper cables and alternators rather than uh little jump boxes starting the diesel engine yeah, let's fire up the rear power unit you'll see in a second i got a big old honking battery out back in the bed of the truck and i use that for auxiliary electrons Okay, let's get over to our Stang here. Yeah, it's a little bit more inconvenient, but it's much, much less stressful because I know it's gonna fight your, uh, light these things off and fire them up every time, not just sometimes where you're hooking two or three batteries together, trying to get the jump boxes to crank off a little, uh, little 4.6 little engine, or a Toyota engine, or a Honda engine, or anything else of that nature. Oh yeah, security measures and whatnot. There we go. Love my diesel powered jumper box. Look at this. I'm parked like a quarter mile away and my cables are going to reach. Okay, positron on our battery right here. Leave the negative off for the time being because I need to go and connect the other side at the source of the power. So here we'll pop the top here and we reveal a 200 amp hour battery connect to a serious alternator up front, this thing should produce plenty of electrons to, uh, to start this Mustang. And, and I realize I could also use the uh, power and the battery under the hood, but I have this back here, so I'm gonna use this. Because I built it and I like it and I use it. Powering on, zzzzt. there we go. Okay, now let's go start this thing up. Let's see what we get here, key on. Lights are on on the dash. Starting the engine is good to go. Huh, a little bit of smoke from the tailpipe. No matter. Cables back in, disconnected, good. Put that lid back on the battery over there so it, uh, to protect it. Lock it up. Good. Gotta tell you what, this is a, it's a lot of work just for a brake job, let me tell you. 
and it's hot outside. 95 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale. That's pretty nasty. All right, let's get her parked. I'll just nose it up to the dumpster or uh, dumpster. That's my portable dumpster, the Connex box. There you go, Connex, iron down. And we'll shut off the rear system. Nice and easy like. Okay, let's go fetch our Mustang. You know, folks ask me all the time, where do you learn such patience? And the reality is, is if you don't have patience uh, in this kind of business, you'll absolutely lose your mind over the stupid little inconveniences like having to jump start a dead battery in a car. Okay, we are in, let's ride, but not without some climate control because it's a hundred something degrees and some change inside of this beast. A little warm. I don't hear the brakes yet. You guys hear anything? No, nada. All right. Let's see uh, what we hear when we get up to some speed. Okay, engine feels really good. Let's get some speed rolling here and we'll get on the brakes, 40 miles per hour. All right, I see uh, and I feel a vibration in the steering wheel that tells me there's potentially some run out in the, the rotor area. Let's get up over the bridge. We'll go a little faster and see if we can't hear any noises. I'm not hearing any grinding or whatever. Nothing like that, so I guess that's good. Yeah, there's that vibe again. Shaky, shaky, shaky. That's all from the brake. So we have either surface thickness variation in the rotors. That's where the rotor is a little thinner and a little thicker in different spots. And then as the caliper holds the pad stationary and the rotor passes through it, it generates a difference in friction. And that difference in friction is gonna translate into more and less braking effect, uh, thus producing the vibration. That's one way to get vibration. The other way is the rotor's just kind of warped and it's weeby wobbling around. Uh, but the majority of vibrations are caused by issues with the surface and the thicknesses of said surfaces. It's usually not a warp or a, a, an out of round situation that causes uh, those brake vibes. But most people just say warped because that's the generic term. Not a lot of folks understand the concept of surface thickness variations. But now you do, because I just explained it. So this video is now a win. Anyway, let's get on some brakes right here, top of the hill, and oh yeah, that was pretty nasty. Let's go a little faster, do it again. There it is, see that wheel shaking around? Can't do it too long, it pulled to the right a little bit as well. Yeah, she wants to pull some. Okay, so we've got a pull to the right while braking, a nasty vibration, and they had complained of some noises. Now I'm not hearing them, maybe I'm just deaf, but uh, I think I've got enough to go off of here to uh, increase the level of brake inspection, pull the wheels off and see what the actual friction material is looking like. And then we'll decide whether those pads and rotors are going on or not. Okay. I mean, that's even there at slow speed. It was just like back and forth. Yeah, usually when you get feedback in the pedal and in the, or in the steering wheel, uh, usually that's going to correlate to an issue with your front brakes. If you feel it in your derriere or down at the pedal, that's usually going to suggest there's an issue with the rear brakes. Uh, a lot of times uh, the rear brakes can go unnoticed because it's harder to detect the symptoms and people don't recognize it until there's a noise or like a grind or something like that. Uh, or until they wear out so far that the piston falls out of the caliper, which that's a whole nother mode of failure. But uh, again, usually uh, rear brakes will go unnoticed when they vibrate. Uh, it's usually just the front ones because those are the easiest ones for a driver to, uh, to pick up on. And sometimes people don't even notice that their steering wheel vibrates out of their hands when they uh, apply the brakes. We're back at the shop now, so I can quit jaw, jaw jacking and babbling. We're gonna go ahead and nose this thing in. I'm gonna rack it up. We're gonna pull the wheels and see what we have to work with here. Looking good in the neighborhood. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, right on the money there. Got room for the rear lift arm to swing in. I think we're good to go on the rack, maybe a little farther forward. That's good. Parking the auto, powering down. Beep. All righty, she's on the rack. Mustang moving on up. 
We're gonna need a 21 millimeter socket to pull these wheels off. I love the spinners. I love these old school spinners, man. I wish somebody would bring back spinners. Spinners and beauty rings. You guys remember those? It was a great way to dress up a steel wheel back in the day. And it looks so good. Yeah, I'm thinking chest height right about here. That's good. On the locks. Speaking of on the locks, uh, I may be upgrading a lift in here to a four post lift, a big old 12,000 pound unit. I found one for sale the other day uh, and it may, may be suitable to place outside where that red Shelby is. And uh, I think it's wide enough where if I need to use this stall in here, we can drive over it or under it and I can have a potential uh, alignment slash drive on lift for heavy equipment outside. And that's going to be super cool. Okay. Use it or lose it. This is my uh, least favorite gun. It is a brushed motor gun and uh, I just don't like it. I'm spoiled by all the brushless technology. Then this old school gun came out of the box and I'm like, yeah, I'm not a fan. Oh look, this thing has wheel locks. Gravity, it's the first gravity of the day. So don't worry guys, eventually we're gonna get to the meat of this video. Over here dilly dallying with jump boxes, pickup trucks and wheel locks. All this for a brake job, right? Oh, what do we got? Oh, what? It has wheel spacers, look at this. That's how we got those wheels on this car. See that right there? That is an aluminum wheel spacer. So. Basically, this piece of aluminum bolts onto the studs on the hub where the original wheels are supposed to bolt onto. They did this to increase the offset in order to get these wheels to fit on this car. I did not realize that these were uh, not the original wheels of this vehicle. Anyway, taking a look right down in the hole there, we see quite a bit of brake pad wear on this unit. Here, check it out, visual aids. I got a laser beam. So you see right there, that is our pad area. And then right here, I don't know if this is working out, right there, that's the backing plate. So most of what we're looking at is backing plate. And then the pad is itty bitty behind it all nice and worn out. If we uh, come around to the other side, this pad's a little bit thicker on the inboard. See it right there through the hole? See that? Okay, so we do have some brake pad wear. Taking a look at the rotors, I am observing that my light just died again. Probably because I keep throwing it on the ground. There we go. I'm observing a little bit of what's called heat checking. That's these cracks. Hope you can see it. There's itty bitty little cracks forming in that rotor. And if we back up some, let the light catch it just right. See how those spots are in there, all these little spots? Those are called hot spots. And basically what that is, is the metallurgy is slightly changing uh, due to the amount of heat that's being put into these. It's hardening and softening. And that can be combined with surface thickness variation or actually cause some surface thickness variation. And this is gonna drive our vibration forces that we were feeling on the test drive. Let's go ahead and move on back to the rear and we'll inspect those real quick before we start disassembling further. Same old situation here. We got a wheel lock with the key. Brush motor gun that I hate. I'm only really using this so I can use some of the battery. I don't use these uh, M18 batteries very often. So I like to cycle through my, uh, my batteries. All right, those are looking kind of rustomatic. Let's see what we have here. Let's check for hot spots. I see a little bit, nothing too crazy. I wouldn't expect to see much hot spotting out of the rears because rear brakes do not provide the amount of brake force that the fronts provide. 
Uh, there's different bias percentages, but the rears uh, sort of are there to assist, not really provide a boatload of stopping force. And that's, uh, oh, let's see what we got here. The inboard pad, maybe five or six thirty seconds of an inch, a few millimeters. And this outboard is similar to the outboard on the other side. Uh, what I'm not liking is the amount of rust contact here. Okay, yeah, that's, these ones are okay. There is some thickness variation in it, maybe a little bit of noise. And, and I know that the owner of this car uh, wants this to be trouble free, so we may do some rear brakes. I'm gonna recommend for sure, for certain that we do the fronts, uh, just based on the things we've seen so far. And the rears will be in the suggested category. So if my, uh, my vehicle owner would like to replace the rears, we can do that. These do have a little bit of time left on them. So that's, uh, that's kind of a judgment call on their end. So um, what we're gonna do is give them a ring. I'm gonna start taking the fronts apart. Let's get the other two wheels off first, just, uh, just to inspect those sides before we finalize the recommendation. And then we'll go from there. Okie doke, so I've got the call out to see, uh, see about the rear brakes as a suggestion, not a requirement. These are gonna be in the required uh, category, like I said. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Now, I could probably do this job without pulling these, uh, these faux brake caliper covers off, but I'm not really certain about that and I don't wanna create a situation that's making a bunch of noises. So we're gonna pull this thing off and set it aside. It's a little extra work, but it's a good way to mitigate risk. So we got, looks like two 10 mil nuts hanging on to this, uh, whatever you want to call it thing right here. Let's see if I can't get this to come off. I believe it clips in. Yeah, look at that little clip right there. And the other one, I think something similar. It's got this clip to it. Come here, clip. Need tools and pliers. Boom. Yeah, there we go. Hey, look, there's a normal brake caliper. That's what we're looking for. So next, I'm going to have to probably pull these spacers off. We are going to change the rotors on this. Not that one. Gonna need a thin wall socket. Looks like a thin wall 19. You know what? This video is not even about a brake job. It's about all the other extra stuff sometimes you have to do. I think we're changing the theme. So we've got a 19, now this is called a flip socket. That's a 19 and a 21 millimeter. Uh, 19 and 21 are the two most common sizes for lug nuts. So they have engineered a socket that will work for both, but you have to have a three inch extension. So in this configuration, we've got 19 mil. And in this configuration, it's now a 21. Very clever. Excellent for wheel service applications. So let us pull off this uh, little spacer here. Now these things are okay when used properly. But when you see guys that are stacking these up two inches deep or uh, putting super duper thick thick spacers on, uh, that can be ten, uh, that can be frowned upon. Additionally, if you don't put these on right, you can break them or crack them and it's a great way to make your wheels fall off. Ding, so that's out of the way. This rotor is hot, hot, hot. Let's give this thing a turn here. Now we're gonna pull off our caliper. We will do such things with a 12 millimeter socket. Pull the bolts out of the slide pins. Caliper is now unbolted, so we can pull it off of the, uh, the pads here. Wiggle it out. Set it on top of the rotor so it doesn't fall down. I don't want to hang the caliper uh, from the hose. This one's aluminum, so it's silly lightweight. You could hang it from the hose if you wanted to, but that's just bad practice, so I don't do it. 
here we've got a better view on, uh, on these pad thicknesses, super duper thin. Now, although there is friction material here, uh, this is a scenario where you want to go ahead and change these, these, uh, these pads. Uh, they could hang out for a little while longer, but it's not just the thickness and the time that you get from that thickness that should be considered. The other, what should be considered is the mass of the pad. How much material is here that can absorb and dissipate heat? So if we have a super thin pad and it's almost all the way worn out, we have much less material to absorb the heat from the friction. And at some point, if you overheat these, they will cease to produce friction and you, uh, you experience brake fade. So when they get super thin, it's time to get rid of them. Anyway, let's go ahead and remove our caliper bracket next. That bolt, that bolt, I think we're looking at uh, 15 mil, I think. By the way, how's my audio? Uh, let me know in the comment section what you guys think because I have employed the use of a new microphone, which is really cool because the mic is no longer attached to the camera and I can move around with it. And I'm already feeling uh, that it's easier for me to record things uh, in this configuration. So let's see, my gun was a little too big to fit up there on that little nut. So we're gonna crack it loose with a wrench here. Unthickage, there we go. Now, since that uh, 3 8 gun didn't fit in there, I'm gonna come in with a quarter gun with some wobble action right here. Now that the bullet's loose, the gun just has to turn it out. Nice and easy like. Don't go anywhere, caliper. The, uh, hit you guys, sorry. That hose is rather short. It doesn't really leave me much room to put this caliper, that should be good. Take the bolt out, it's now. Go ahead and pull this rotor, get rid of you. Woo. Somebody greased it up for us. There's no rust back here. Look at that. That's nice. Okay, let me go fetch some of the new parts. We're gonna we're gonna do these one corner at a time. We'll do left front, right front, and then we'll do the rears if they uh, so approve. Okay, let's do a little bit of uh, wiping and greasing here. We get rid of the old grease. No rust, so I'm not gonna hit this with like a wire wheel. No need to. But since they've greased it, I suppose I'll grease it again. Plus, I know you guys like it when I grease the uh, the hubs and whatnot, so we're just gonna do that. Okay, wipe that down, that's nasty. And I, uh, I also got some new grease. I had been using the purple slide pin lube for the longest time. Uh, a couple decades, actually, I've been using the Permatex uh, brake lube and a lot of people were going hey man you shouldn't be using those on slide pins because the consensus is is that it likes to gum up the slide pins after a bunch of heat cycles now i can say i've never personally experienced that with the purple lube but i've seen and read of enough testimony where people uh, claim that that stuff gums up and it makes the slide pin seize so based on all available information I have elected to just change the style of grease used on slide pins to prevent potential slide pin seizing with the purple lubricant. I hope that makes sense. So now, that's out of the way. Let me go ahead and uh, wash this rotor off a little bit here. I probably shouldn't have put grease on it actually. I need to get the, uh, what you call it, all the, uh, the oils and stuff off the face of the rotor. I guess I'll do it on the ground. Yeah, see, I can walk way over here, and you guys can still hear me. So I suppose this microphone might be a game changer. Anyway, let's give the... Oh, I forgot. <laughs> let's give this a bit of a spray here to get the surface oil off of it. There we go. Spin her around. There's an oil layer on these new rotors to prevent them from rusting while they are in storage and in transit. And that's what I just sprayed off. So we'll take our rotor assembly, gonna hang it up right there. Now while I'm here, 
I may as well go ahead and fit the wheel spacer. And we'll throw the, uh, the low profile lug nuts on there. Yeah, see, I was way over there by my cart talking. And you guys could still hear me. Now this is where this gets a little dicey. How do we torque these? Do I just uh, hammer down on them with an impact gun and, and that's that? And stretch out the factory lug nuts? It can't be torqued in the traditional sense because traditionally you have to put the car in the ground so that the hubs don't turn and then you can torque those lug nuts. In this moment right here, this is a perfect moment for uh, to forget and fail because those are not torqued, but this thing is on. So I could potentially cause a loose wheel if I don't remember what I've done here with that. So these things should be used under extreme caution and uh, not taken lightly. Anyway, there's our, uh, our old slide pin. Let me tell you what, we'll hang the bracket and then lube the pins. That will probably be easier. That one in there. Back at it again with the uh, quarter inch driver just to run the bolts around. head extendo wrench and make it tight it's good and the bottom one there we go so now okay pull these old pins out give them a white they're in good shape they're not uh not all rusted and there's no hardened grease on them. Pull them out, wipe them off. Take the new grease. I'm gonna wipe that stuff on, similar to how I used to wipe the purple grease. Put that guy back. Same thing on the bottom pin, give it a wipe. Do it again just for fun. Because I love my job so much, I'll do it twice. Okay, that's good, that's good. So both of these guys are, those are torqued, those are lubed, but we're still forgetting the torque sequence on these lug nuts right here. So I'll show you how we're gonna do that. Okay, utilizing a pry bar screwdriver. It looks like a screwdriver, but it's a pry bar in fact. So it's an actual pry driver. We're gonna put that in the fins on the rotor. And that's gonna keep this rotor from turning because the pry bar is acting against the, uh, the caliper bracket. Set the torque wrench up to 100 foot-pounds. That is the factory spec for these lug nuts. Now I can apply lug nut torque to the wheel spacer. go. That's that. She's all set. Okay, so before we hang the pads, I need to go ahead and replace the, uh, the shims here that our pads are going to be riding on. Little uh, 
looking like stainless steel shims. I don't know if they're actually stainless or not. They look stainless. Uh, either way, the new pads came with a replacement set of shims. So we're going to replace said shims. So it should be noted that some brake systems have multiple different shims and then some, they're all the same. So we need to compare these and make sure that these new shims are in fact compatible. Let's see here. Yep, that one goes there. Yeah, there's some slight differences mostly in the little retainer clip here, but I think we're good. And I think all of these shims are the same. No, they're not. Look here, this is the one that came off the top, but if we reference the little clip, you'd see the tall ramp side is over here, not over there. So there's at least two different, uh, uh, two different styles of shim that goes to this car. So we have to make sure we get them correct. And that's not it. And that one is it. Get in there, Shim. Okay. And of course, there's the two on the, uh, the inside as well. Let's go in there and just pop that guy out. This is why pocket screwdrivers are your best friend ever. It's amazing how much uh, you can accomplish with just one little screwdriver. Good. And then it's gonna be tough to see. We're running out of viewing space here and illuminators. The lumens are limited. Let's see if I can't get this right. Well, good enough. Hope you can see. There's nothing more I can do to remedy the situation of the shade, the darkness from within. Got it. See what I did there? A series of not its followed up with a got it. Okay, all four shims are in place. Now we may hang the pads. So with regard to the uh, individual pieces of brake pad, there are no, whoop, gravity. There's no identifying marks that dictate whether these are inboard or outboard or nothing that changes their uh, their position or requires them to be placed a certain way. So we just kind of stick them in as we see fit. The only odd difference about these pads is that it's got these uh, little springs here built in and that is there to push the pad away from, from the rotor. Everything is a hammer, including brake pads. Okay, inboard one, same thing. Just kind of stick it in there. Yeah, see if we squeeze them on, they spring themselves away, see that? And that's good, that's so they can't just sit there and ride on the brake pad and wear themselves out prematurely, brake rotor. So next up, we're gonna refocus our attention on the caliper. We just need to compress these pistons and then we're ready to place this caliper uh, back into its home here. So I'm lacking loads and loads of space for this demonstration, so bear with me here. But uh, I've got a brake caliper compressing tool Basically, it's a flat plate with a flat plate, uh, two threaded rods inside. One is reverse threads, one is standard threads with a ratcheting mechanism. So as I ratchet this, it's threading the center and spreading these plates apart. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to compress those pistons with ease, and I don't have to worry about breaking them with like a pair of pliers. So we'll stick this guy right inside of there. And... To space it out some, I'm gonna take one of the old pads if it's going to fit, and we'll shove that in there with it. Let's see what happens here. You guys see? Sure. Now as I ratchet this, again, it's gonna compress both of those pistons, push them back into their caliper body bore and it's gonna give me the space to slide it over our new thicker brake pads. And no, I do not have to open the bleeder valve to do this. It is okay. And 
voila. Now we take that same caliper, bring it on down, push the new pads in and get this guy around. Tight squeeze. Bone hammer. There we go. That is on and in position. Now I can stick the fasteners in it. We'll tighten this caliper down and this corner is good to go. Let's see, 12 mil and a 12. Get the bottom one lined up with the slide pin like so. Was not looking. Quick suck change on the little gun. Pickage. And at the top side. Beautiful. Hi right, guys, that's one corner ready to rock and roll. I don't have word yet about the rear, so let's go ahead and repeat the procedure over on the right front and uh, we'll get this side knocked out as well. Right y'all. We're off on the passenger front still. Repeating procedure. Get rid of our high performance brake caliper cover. It's red, so you know it's good. Got to pull the little clips out of it. Those clips are side specific too. I, uh, I was having some trouble on the other side. I was fighting with them a little bit. And they, uh, they are location specific. There's an offset in the groove and that is why. Uh, regardless, it's off. So, two bolts. Dum dum. That can stay there for now. That's fine. Pads coming out. 13, 15, 15, 15. We'll get the bracket bolts loose. Unclickage. Fifteen wobble. Actually, we're going to get the top one first. Hey, you guys got hit with a caliper. What is that? Danger. One partner in the bottom unit. Oh man, it got me in the worst ways. They got me, so I was hanging on to it too. This motor stinks. I can smell the stink coming from the brushes. Here, this uh, caliper is gonna get annoying fast, so I need to figure out how to hang it out of my way. There, there we go, that's better. Looking good. Good in the neighborhood. Let's see here. Let's pull that rotor and again, we've got some grease in there. The grease has been hot, it looks kind of baked in. Let's give it a quick wipe. There. Nice and not shiny-ish. Yeah, so I think I really like this microphone. 
I'm on the other side of the car right now and uh, you guys can still hear me, which is pretty sweet if you ask me. Technology is great. I'm gonna throw some lube in there. I believe this car once upon a time lived a life up in Ohio. Down in Ohio, swag like Ohio. Down in Ohio, swag like Ohio. If anybody knows about that northern rust, I see why there's grease here. So I'm gonna put it back. Let's go fetch the new rotor. So listen, for the sake of saving some time, I've already uh, brake cleaned this particular rotor off of here. So let's just get the thing slapped back together real quick like. Like I said, I'm trying to make some progress and whatnot. I don't wanna I don't wanna hang out and just do the same brake procedure over and over and over again. Cause then you guys will click away and get bored. And that would be unfortunate. But I want you to click away. I want you to stay here and hang out with me. There we go. Yeah, that is the uh, very dangerous way to secure fasteners, you guys. Use extreme caution if you install components that are flush fitting and not fully seated and torqued. Because if I were to, let's say I went to lunch right now and I walked away, come back, I may not realize or remember that I left these loose. And they will back off if they are not torqued appropriately or properly. or proper, properly, appropriately. They're not tight, you know what I'm saying. These ones I will apply torque with the manual method. Fix. There we go, that's good. And you can't see because you guys are way far away. Let's bring you over here so you can look at my slide rods. Yep, wipe them down. Get all that old lube off. Fresh lube coming in. Stick that right back where it goes. Uh, one other thing about slide pins, you should really put them back where you found them. Uh, these ones don't have the feature, but there are some slide pins that have like a little rubber insert right here that's designed to mitigate noise and vibration and things. And those are location specific. So you want to uh, make it a habit to put your, uh, your pins back in the hole in which you had found them. Kind of like most things in automotive, you want to just put it back where it goes and not try to reinvent the wheel. Okay, that one's good. Let me figure out where my pocket driver is. Ha, it was in my pocket. We'll go ahead and pull off all these shims next here and re-shim this bracket. And yeah, I could have done all this, you know, off the vehicle, throw the, the caliper bracket on the bench and just set it up there, but it's just as easy to do it uh, like on the car because the car is a bench. It serves as its own bench. There we go. And that one does not go there. But this one does. Okay. So now move around here. I'll get the, uh, the inboard ones. Okie dokes, let's get this, uh, uh, what do you call it, wheel spacer kind of torqued on a little bit before I forget, because like I said, it's gravity. It's easy to forget, and I do not want to forget. Because then the wheel falls off, and that would be bad. So, we're going to repeat procedure. Stick a pry driver in there to hang on to the rotor. One hundred foot pounds of torque. This is kind of going one-handed because I'm holding on to that pry driver over there. It wants to come out. There we go. 
think that's my next one. Uno mas. And then we'll recheck the first one. You notice on the last spacer how they uh, required a little bit more torque after the first pass. Which is kind of odd because usually wheels are not like that. But since these are spacers, I guess that uh, explains the discrepancy. I don't know. Let's see what this one does. Nope, they're good. All right. Actually, I just realized I got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, the last scene where we were, I was over here uh, putting on those shims and the camera cut off because it got too hot and it died. Didn't notice till I was done with the shims. Uh, regardless, the two rear shims are in. That's now torqued. Let's throw the pads in. Now, I will not be applying lubricant to the pad surface where the pistons meet the pads and where the, the fingers on the caliper meet the pads. It's not really necessary. Because you see these pads, they've got this, uh, this metallic coated shim on there. And that serves a very similar function to what the grease would have done. So there really is no need for me to grease these. And I'm not going to. I don't like to put grease on the friction material because when it gets hot, it, uh, the viscosity changes and the grease will run out and cover things and you'll get greasy brake parts. And I just, I don't like to do that. So I'm not going to put grease on, uh, on my brake pads. I just don't do it. And I realize there's a hundred million ways to do things. And a lot of people religiously will place grease on their pads. I, I just elect not to. I could be wrong, uh, just like uh, with the, the purple Permatex stuff but uh, I don't feel that I am on that aspect, so I'm, I'm not gonna change my ways. You only get like a partial change out of me, guys. You don't get the full Monty, unfortunately. So let's get this guy in here like it's supposed to be. Here, we can afford some space. You guys can get in there a little closer. Watch those pistons compress. There we go. Just ratchet them on in. One other thing that should be mentioned when doing brakes, you should not under any circumstance, start compressing pistons with more than one caliper removed. Reason being, this is a closed hydraulic system. And if the other caliper was off the vehicle and I compress these pistons, there's a chance that that fluid that's displaced out of this caliper will not go back into the master cylinder. It may actually go and pressurize a different caliper. If it does that, it can actually push those pistons out of the caliper and it'll dump a bunch of fluid all over the floor. So you do not want to try to compress your caliper pistons when other calipers have been removed from the vehicle. You're, you're asking for it. And I know you can get away with it, and most times it's not a problem, but the one time that it is a problem, you won't notice until you hear the thunk on the floor, and then you feel brake fluid splash on you from the other side of the car, you look over and you see it all running down everywhere out of the uh, the other other caliper and making a mess everywhere. And at that point, you're hot, you're tired, you're sweaty, and you're now on the hook for a caliper unless you can somehow manage to get the piston back in, which is a whole different skill set on its own. And you may not be able to pull that off. So just don't do it. I know it's uh, all fundamental repairs and stuff, but things can get out of control quickly. Okay, this guy right here is good to go. Let's get our wheel straightened out here. And I still do not have authorization yet to complete the, uh, 
the rear brakes on this unit, so I'm going to be on, uh, on hold for a little while. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I think this video is reaching a little bit of a lengthy, uh, lengthy bit of time, actually. I think I'm right around my 40 minute mark. So you guys weigh in in the comment section down below. Would you like to see me go through these rear brakes as well? If the consensus is a yes, then when I get approval or denial for these, I will make another video and I'll put that on the second channel, Rayman Ray Off Duty. And I realize it's labeled Off Duty, but I do reserve that channel for things and situations such as this where there's a little bit more work to do and it's sort of a cliffhanger, but not. So let me know if you wanna see the rear brake job on this thing in the comments. Uh, if so, I will go ahead and film that video whenever I get approval or denial for that, on that or for those on that matter. And uh, it will end up being uh, over there on uh, that secondary channel. Uh, I'll make a community post if it shows up, but most of you are already subscribed to the second channel who would be interested in such additional things. So I'm sure you would get the notification if you have a notification bell turned on for the off-duty channel. Having said all that, I will go ahead and commence with the ending of my moment of shameless self-promotion. And I'm also going to go ahead and end this video because that's why I started on this little rant. So having said that, guys, as always, I'd like to thank you for watching this video. Uh, let me know what you think about this Mustang, these brakes, and my, uh, my brake procedures in the comment section down below. Uh, please feel free to weigh in any stories you may have regarding aluminum wheel spacers. And uh, I will look forward to seeing your feedback in the comment section. So guys, again, and as always, like thank you for watching this video. Hope to see you on the next one. And most importantly, do not forget to have yourselves a fantastic day. See you guys later in a video in a Mustang GT brake job in a transmission.